We have a really good lesson today, and I'm praying that I can do it justice. It's based on Daniel chapter 4. I think folks maybe have been a little confused as we go through our study guide because we're on lesson 5, studying Daniel 4. And uh, that's happened a few times along the way. I want to welcome our friends who are watching online. We have a lot who watch this program and study with us live on Facebook. And we have folks who are watching the satellite feed from around the world. And some who are watching are some of our online members of Granite Bay. And I should just mention at this point, if you have been tuning in, and if you do not have a local church where you can attend, if you'd like to know how you could be one of our online members, simply go to our website and you can inquire there. There's a place where you can contact us, say, what's involved in that? And what do I need to do? And, and the Kathy and or Karen will get back to you and talk to you about that. So welcome. Daniel chapter 4 is our study today. And you pray for me because I'm going to be preaching, teaching, speaching. Um, and I have a lot of what I think is great material to cover. This is one of the central chapters in Daniel. The whole book sort of comes together in this experience of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so if you get your uh, lesson, go to the memory verse. Let's start with that. Lesson is called From Pride to Humility. Just right there, from pride to humility covers a great controversy. Starts with the devil's pride and it is redeemed through the humiliation of Christ. So you've got the, the crux of the whole gospel in this lesson. Memory verse is Daniel 4 verse 3 and that's from the New King James Version. Daniel 4 3, if you'd say that with me, that'd be great. You ready? How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion from generation to generation. Now, as we go through our study, to, to go ahead, just take your Bibles now and you want to turn to Daniel chapter 4. Um, I've been studying this and uh, there's a key message. Uh, this is the last chapter where Nebuchadnezzar appears. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's in chapter 1, he's in chapter 2, he's in chapter 3, he's in chapter 4. Uh, this takes place uh, probably about 10 years before his death because from the time of the dream, seven years go by and he gets his mind back again. He only lives two or three years beyond that. And so you've got several years that go from Daniel captivity chapter 1 until Daniel chapter 2 and the king has that dream. Nobody can interpret except Daniel. And then he, chapter 3, Oh, probably another t t eight, ten years go by. He builds the golden image. And now this is taking place about 20 years later. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar reigned for about 40 years. He's sort of like a, a parallel of Solomon in some ways who also reigned for 40 years. And um, this is a unique chapter in the Bible. If for no other reason, it's one of the few places you're going to open your Bible, you're going to read an address that's coming to you. It's a testimony from a pagan. It is not written by a Jew. It's written by a Gentile. But he's giving glory to God. And I want to just point out some high points. Notice what one of the central messages of this chapter is. It's one of the longer chapters in Daniel. You got about 37 verses, uh, about uh, 1290 words that are in here. Go to verse 3. His dominion is from generation to generation. You can look in verse 2. Most High God. And you go to verse 17. The Most High rules. Stay with me now. I'm just going to jump down to verse 24. The Most High. You look now in, um, in verse uh, 25. The Most High rules. Go to verse 26. Come to know the Most High that heaven rules. You go to verse uh, 32, the most high rules. Go to verse 34, I blessed the most high. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Um, and then you go to his final testimony in verse 36. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven whose works are works of truth. And I'm going to just tell you, the chapter, quick overview, and then we're going to go back and we're going to break it apart. I want to make sure I give you the story. Nebuchadnezzar relates this experience 
says, I'm at ease in my palace, things are going well, takes place after he had conquered Egypt. The Nebuchadnezzar had conquered Assyria, had conquered Israel, conquered several kingdoms. One of the big uh, difficult battles for him was when he fought against the Egyptian empire and he conquered them. At that point, he controlled the crux of three continents. That's why he calls it a worldwide empire. The trade that went through Asia from India and Europe and Africa all through the Middle East, he got the revenue from that. Uh, it was a golden kingdom. Count up how much gold was in Solomon's temple. Uh, David talks about all that he gave to the building of the temple. Nebuchadnezzar carried all that to Babylon. That's just a small piece of all that he had. It was the golden empire. Now he's finally conquered these kingdoms. He's got a little bit of rest and ease. By the way, what happens when kings get a little bit of rest? Uh, David was walking on the roof after a nice rest. He got into trouble with Bathsheba. And so you always have to brace yourself when a king says everything was going great then. He has this dream that terrifies him. This king had been through wars. He was a hardened soldier. A little terrified him, but this dream terrifies him. And he has his dream, and uh, the dream, in a nutshell, and it, the dream is rehearsed two or three times in the chapter, so I won't read it every time. It's basically, he dreams about this great tree that reaches unto the heavens, great branches, full of fruit, all the birds find shade, the beasts are comforted in the shade. The birds and the uh, air and the beasts are fed by the fruit that comes from this tree. This is a tree that gives life. It is a tree of life. And it's above all the other trees. It's exalted. And then there's a voice comes from heaven, the Holy One, the Watcher. It says, cut down the, the tree, chop off its branches, scatter its fruit, and surround it with a band of bronze and iron until seven times pass over it. And the, everyone knows that the Most High rules in the children of men. And Nebuchadnezzar thought that he had done it all. And he's wondering what this means. Calls in the wise men. Wise men can't understand what it is. Now, you know, it's interesting that in Daniel chapter 2, the wise men of Nebuchadnezzar say, just tell us the dream and we will certainly give you the interpretation. This time Nebuchadnezzar tells them the dream. They still can't interpret it like the wise men of Pharaoh. And then it says, finally, Daniel comes in. Daniel's a little older now. Maybe Daniel waited until they exhausted their resources so that God would get the glory. He comes in and then he interprets the dream. And he basically says, King, you are the tree. Now I want to show you something. This is not the first time in the Bible this has happened. Um, go to the book of Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel chapter 31. <clears throat> I told you Ezekiel first so you'd find the neighborhood. Now I want you to go to chapter 31. And then I want you to start with verse 3. See if you see some similarities between the vision of Ezekiel, which happens not long after Nebuchadnezzar's experience. And it tells us, um, Indeed, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon. He's talking about the Assyrian Empire as compared to a tree with fine branches that shaded the forest, and of high stature, a tall tree. Its top was among the thick boughs. The waters made it grow. Underground waters gave it height. Again, a tall tree. With the rivers running around the place where it was planted, and it sent out rivulets to all the trees of the field. Therefore its height was exalted above the trees of the field. A very tall tree, higher than any tree. Its bows were multiplied. Its branches became long because of the abundance of water. And it sent them out and all the birds of heaven made their nest in its bows. Does this sound familiar? Under its branches the beasts. This is almost identical to Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Of the field. And they brought forth their young. They gave birth under its shadow. And thus it was beautiful in greatness and in the length of its branches because its roots reached the abundant waters. It's well nourished like Psalm 1, a tree planted, planted by the rivers of waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide it. They, no other tree could eclipse it. The fir trees were not like its boughs and the chestnut trees were not like its branches. No tree in the garden of God was like it in beauty. Yes, of course, he's, it's a prophecy. I made it beautiful with a multitude of branches so that the trees of Eden envied it. He's talking about the kingdom of Assyria. 
that were in the garden of God. But look what happens. Verse 10, Therefore thus says the Lord, because you have increased in height, and it set its top among the thick boughs, its heart was lifted up in its height, therefore I will deliver it into the hand of the mighty ones of the nation, and he will surely deal with it. Assyria was delivered to Nebuchadnezzar. And I have driven it out for wickedness because of its pride. And aliens, the most terrible of the nations, have cut it down and left its branches, have fallen on the mountains and all the valleys, and it, it is broken by the rivers and the land, and all the peoples of the earth have gone from under its shadow. And then go to, um, you go to verse 16. I made the nations shake at the sound of its fall. Timber is the picture, you know, this big tree falls and crashes. When I cast it down into the pit, and it's basically, it says this because it was lifted up, because of pride. This is what happens in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. By the way, at the end of this chapter, if you go to uh, Ezekiel 31, verse, um, oh, verse 18, the very last, it says, this is Pharaoh, all his multitude, says the Lord God. So this is a prophecy given to the Pharaoh of Egypt saying, look what happened to Assyria. Because of its pride, it was big, tall, thought it would last forever, and it fell. And God is telling through Ezekiel, Pharaoh, you will fall. Just like that tree fell. So trees are often symbols of nations. Does Jesus say, behold the fig tree and all the trees, when its branch is yet tender and it puts forth shoots, you know that summer is hot, nigh. So likewise, when you see all these things come to pass, know that it is even near the door, right? He compares Israel to a tree. When he cursed the fig tree, what was that a type of? It had leaves and no fruit a fruitless tree. They had all the forms of religion, but they didn't have the fruits of the Spirit, and Jesus cursed that tree. And we, you know, read that that is a, a type of Israel. So, back to the dream in um, Daniel chapter 4. So, you got this great tree. Do you know the Bible begins with a tree? Tree of life. This tree is a tree of life. It's like that tree of Assyria. Everything's fed by it. And uh, this great tree that is dreamed about is like a tree of life. Le let me get in and let Nebuchadnezzar speak for himself. He doesn't say much in the Bible, so I shouldn't rob his time. Go to uh, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. He's sending out this testimony to everybody. Peace be multiplied to you, pronounces a benediction. I thought it good to declare the, the signs and wonders that the Most High has worked for me. How great are His signs, how mighty are His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, His dominion from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace, and I saw a dream that made me afraid, and the thoughts of my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore issued a decree to bring forth all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream. And they went through their incantations, and they cut open an animal and tried to read its entrails, and they put up the tea leaves, and they read his palm, and they went through all their goofy things that they go through. They said, let us look at the stars tonight, and we'll tell you what the dream means. And either they couldn't agree or they had no answer at all, but they couldn't tell them what it meant. Sometimes God waits until we exhaust all the earthly means before we turn to heaven. They couldn't make known to me the dream, but at last Daniel came in before me. It's interesting, the king mentions his Hebrew name. He doesn't, uh, usually they skip right past that. King mentions his Hebrew name. And this, by the way, this chapter is written in Aramaic, not in Hebrew. Daniel, his name, Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, Nebuchadnezzar is confessing, I gave him a name according to my God when we first hired him. And it says, the spirit of the holy God is in him. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret thing troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I've seen in its interpretation. By the way, as some of you in your Bibles, it'll say, I know the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Is that right? Some of you, it says gods. Some is singular. That word can be either singular or plural, depending on the context. So um, he may have said the spirit of the holy gods or God is in you, but I think that 
because everywhere else in the chapter he says his dominion, the most high rules, whenever Nebuchadnezzar talks about God, the other places he uses the singular, we think he has been converted from polytheism to monotheism in this chapter. And he has come to realize the gods of Babylon are powerless and it's the holy God. He says, I've had this dream. This was the vision of my head while on my bed. And then he describes the dream. I'll read it to you once again. I'm in chapter 4, verse 10 of Daniel. I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth. And its height was great and the tree grew and became strong. And its height reached to the heavens. And it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant. And in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of heaven dwelt in its branches. All flesh was fed from it. While I saw in the vision of my head while on my bed, there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. And he cried aloud and he said thus, chop down the tree and cut off its branches and strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and the roots in the earth bound with a, ba a band of iron and bronze. In the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the field and on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man and give him the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. The decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones is in order, this is all happening, that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men. Sometimes we think we rule. And gives it to whomever he will and sets over it even the lowest of men. Just because God gives us a position of authority doesn't mean we should be proud because God sets over it the lowest of men. Now notice something. The decree is that He's going to go from the heart of a man to the heart of a beast. When you get to Daniel chapter 7, you've got these seven animals. You remember what they are? I know where I'm jumping ahead, but this ties together here. What's the first animal? Lion? You got a bear, leopard, and this nondescript monster beast. Um, so who is a lion? Babylon. Starts out as a beast. But what happens to that lion? It says a man's heart is given to it and it stands on its feet like a man. Nebuchadnezzar is Babylon. In this parable here, he goes from man to beast. But in Daniel it says he was converted and he went from beast to man. Have you noticed that? And so at the end of the story, he is glorifying God. Man was made originally how? in the image of God. But with the fall, what happened? Started to act like beasts. The purpose of the devil is to erase the image of God from man. The most lost man in the Bible, have you read it in chapter 5 of Mark about the demoniac? He is the most hopeless case in the Bible. Surrounded by pigs, living in a tomb, covered with chains, naked, cutting himself, crying aloud, running around like an animal, because this is what the devil wants to do is turn men into beasts. You know, you can find examples of this in uh, uh, several places in the Bible. You look, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. Paul says, if in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. Is Paul saying that I went into a, a pit and I fought with wild lions and beasts and bears? And no. Saying the people that he worked with were beasts that he fought with in Ephesus. Look at 2 Peter 2, verse 12. But these, like natural brute beasts, are made and caught to be destroyed. They speak evil of things they do not understand. They will utterly perish in their own corruption. Romans 8, 13 ties it off for us. If you live according to the flesh, a beast, you will die. But by the Spirit, like the Son of Man, it says you will put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so... What you have here is you get this transition of someone who is supposed to be a king, made in the image of God. But because of pride, he becomes a beast. And this is what you see happening all through the Bible. People like Esau say, I'm going to sell my birthright, 
because I'm controlled by the flesh instead of the spirit. Am I making sense? That beast-like man that was filled with devils came to Jesus, he set him free, and his mind, his reason returned to him. And so everybody, we all feel we're part animal and we're part spirit. The question is, what has control? Are we led by the spirit or the flesh? Nebuchadnezzar, because of pride, ends up becoming like a beast. Now, I know I'm not going through the exact sections of the lesson, but you'll see we'll, we'll be covering them all. I'm just mixing them up a little bit. And he says here, until he knows, you're going to go through this, seven times will pass over you, until you know the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he will. Verse 18, Daniel 4, this dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen, now Belteshazzar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of the kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, it says it several times, was astonished for a time. Doesn't mean he was flummoxed, that he didn't know. He is quiet and he's thinking, wow, this is going to be heavy. How do I tell the king this? He knows what it says. It's like when the, the uh, baker says to Joseph, I've had this dream and the ravens pluck the food off my head. Joseph's thinking, ah, how do I tell this guy? You're going to lose your head in three days. It's not easy. He does tell him. Remember Samuel got a dream? A little boy, he's told to go tell uh, Eli that uh, your sons are going to die in one day and your house is going to be cursed because you did not follow me and your sons live like beasts. That's pretty much what it says. And Samuel didn't want to give that message. And Daniel doesn't want to tell the king. It's not happy. I mean, sometimes prophets have to give a tough message. It cost John the Baptist his head. Daniel was astonished for time. His thoughts troubled him. So the king said, Belshazzar, don't be troubled. I can tell from your expression. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> you know what it means. What is the interpretation? He said, my Lord, the dream concerns those who hate you. Its interpretation concerns your enemies. This is going to make your enemies happy. The tree that you saw that grew and became strong, whose height reached to heaven, which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, in whose branches the birds of heaven had their home. It is you, O king. Now, doesn't that sound like chapter 2 where he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. That made Nebuchadnezzar feel pretty good. And this makes Nebuchadnezzar feel uh, apprehensive because he knows it's nice, I'm a big tree, but I know what happens to that tree. In the same way Daniel said, another kingdom will follow you, now Daniel says, you're going to get chopped down. But there's also a good part. It says, the stump is left in the earth. It is you, O king. You have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reached to the heavens and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And in that you saw a holy one coming down, saying, chop down the tree. And that angel's name was Paul Bunyan. But leave its stump and its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze. In the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Now, I want to pause here and tell you, <clears throat> um, I speak to you as one who has cut down many trees. <laughs> and I know something about trees. Uh, there are some trees, you cut them down and they are dead. You cut down a fir tree, it ain't coming back. But if you cut down a madrone tree and some trees, if the ground is still moist and the roots stay alive, a whole other tree can come out of the roots of that tree in the same spot. If the roots are dry and dead, then, you know, it says root and branch, that means it's gone. So this is some kind of tree that has the, uh, the ability to spring up from the roots. I've cut down oak trees before, and those things, they're just, they drive you crazy because instead of one tree coming up, ten come up where you cut down that one. I can take you to places in the woods where I, I logged some oaks years ago and I cut down one tree and now there's just like all these trees came out. You've probably seen them before. And they all get big. But they all branch out. And, and this is what he's saying is going to happen. The reason that it's bound with a band of iron and bronze, and I'm not sure exactly why iron and bronze, but the bands are there because when you're working and when you're farming and there's a stump, you keep knocking it down and beating it down, eventually it'll die. It's almost like it's protecting it. Uh, it's, it's being banded 
so that it'll stay in one place and it'll come back again. And again, it doesn't say exactly the species of tree, but it's one of those trees that'll come back if it's moist with the dew of heaven. And it says, uh, this is the interpretation, O king, verse 24, the decree of the Most High. Again, that's the central theme. Which has come upon my Lord the King. They will drive you from men. Your dwelling will be with the beasts of the field. And they'll make you, make you eat grass like the oxen. You will be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven times will pass over you. Now, a time was a complete cycle of the seasons. It meant a year. The other places in Daniel and Revelation, it talks about a time, a times, and the dividing of time. That meant one complete year, a pair or a couple of years, which is two more, that'd be three, and the dividing of one. So it's three and a half years because you're using a day for a year. But you don't use a day for a year in this prophecy because it tells you what the fulfillment is. Matter of fact, I should probably pause at this point and let you know these seven times. This, this chapter, friends, I'll tell you, it is talked about a lot, especially among those that like prophecy. Um, many people take the seven times and they apply a day for a year. Now, if three and a half years is how many days? Every admin has got to go. 1,260. You ought to know that. 42 months, three and a half years. It's just 1260, 1260, 1260. So that's a big number. How long did Elijah preach? 1260. How long did Jesus teach? Three and a half years, 1260, 42 months. How long does that woman flee in Revelation? 42 months, three, three and a half years, 1260. It's half of seven. How long from the time of the cross until Stephen is stoned? 1260. How long till Vashti is deposed? Have you ever read Esther? In the third year of the reign of Ahasuerus, he has a feast that is 180 days. At the end of that feast, they call forth Vashti and she doesn't come. And the process begins and they get a Jewish queen. It's after three and a half years. Three plus 180 is how much? 1260. All right. Now what if you say seven times, not three and a half, but three and a half and three and a half is seven. So what's that? 2,520. Now, a lot of people have taken that time period and said, what if we apply a day for a year? What does this mean? And I'll just tell you some of the different theories. For those who are watching, people have sometimes taken things I say, they cut it, and they put it online, and they say, here's what Pastor Doug believes, and they don't have my preliminary remarks that says, this isn't what I believe. These are beliefs that are out there. <laughs> so I hope nobody does that. The Jehovah Witnesses apply a day for a year. They take this time period, and this is what they used to predict the second coming of the Lord in 1914. They said that in 607, with the destruction of Jerusalem, that's the starting point. If you go um, 2,520 years, that takes you to 1914. When Jesus did not come in 1914, I think they may have tried to reset the date, and then they said, well, he did come, but it was a spiritual coming. Um, then you've got evangelicals that apply the day for a year. Adventists are not the only ones that know about a day for a year. That's a pretty solid biblical principle. A lot of evangelicals say that um, this is a prophecy that is talking about when um, Nebuchadnezzar's dream takes place, which is about 572 B.C. Do you know if you go from the dream of Nebuchadnezzar in 572 and you go 2,520 years, it comes to 1948. What happened then? Israel is formed as a nation. They say Israel was a type of the tree that was cut down because Israel is that tree of life that fed all the world and you can understand why they got excited about that. And so they look at it as they say this is about Israel. And, um, and then there are others that say um, it reaches to 1844. And it's like everyone picks their starting point. William Miller, he had this reaching to 1844. And so everyone picks their kind of their favorite starting point. And uh, let me see, yeah, the, the Miller, and there's still some people out now that do the 2520. You've probably heard of that. They start 677 when King Manasseh was taken to Babylon. And they say it starts then. That's an odd place to start it. And that goes to 1844. So there's a lot of people that apply the day for the year to this prophecy. But should we do that? Or do we already know what the fulfillment is? Does Daniel tell us what the fulfillment is? It's King Nebuchadnezzar. 
These are literal uh, years that are in this prophecy, and you see the fulfillment of the time in here. So, when Daniel explains this to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is, uh, he, he's a little worried. Uh, Daniel is telling the king, um, therefore my advice, this is verse 27, my advice to you, O king, break off your sins, one of the most important parts of the chapter, break off your sins by being righteous, doing righteousness, and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Now, you might want to underline that. It says, perhaps this might be a lengthening to your prosperity. Let's presume that Daniel is a doctor and he's going to tell you now how to lengthen your prosperity. How many of you want to lengthen your tranquility? Break off your sins by doing righteousness. Show mercy to the poor. The Bible says, blessed are the merciful. They will obtain mercy. It will be a lengthening. Humble yourself. It will be a lengthening of your tranquility, of your prosperity. It's a similar word. Nebuchadnezzar probably sat up and paid attention to Daniel's advice. You don't give a king a lot of advice if it's not asked for. But Nebuchadnezzar said, okay. He behaved himself and he humbled himself and uh, the dream shook him up. Remember, he was scared. But after a while, he couldn't help it. He's walking after 12 months. I'm in verse 28. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. And he's speaking of himself in like the second person here. At the end of 12 months, He's walking on the royal palace of Babylon. He's walking about the royal palace. And the king spoke. Now, let me just tell you about Babylon before I tell you what he said. It's called the golden kingdom. It's the lion. It's the king of the beasts. When you get to the beasts, it's the gold. When you get to the metals, one of the seven wonders of the world, the hanging gardens of Babylon, was there of the ancient world. Um, by the way, the only surviving memorial in, I think Herodotus had the seven wonders of the ancient world is the Great Pyramids. Everything else is gone. It's like the Colossus of Rhodes and there was a number of uh, Temple of Jupiter and the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. His wife, Nebuchadnezzar's wife, he uh, acquired was from the mountains and when she came to the plains of Babylon, she just used to get homesick. She says, there's no mountains here. It's all flat. It's kind of like when you go to the the plains of Texas. All the mountains are upside down. They got these valleys, but there's no, everything else is flat. And I remember some, one of my friends that lived in Texas went to California. She said, I couldn't wait to get out of California. You can't see anything. There's mountains in the way. <laughs> so she went and she said, there's no mountains. And she was homesick. He said, I will build you a mountain. So he made this great multi-step pyramid. He terraced it with wonderful gardens from the most exotic, beautiful plants around the world, and it was uh, the climate in Babylon back then wasn't as much of a desert as it is today. It's a little more mild. And um, he had devised these very ingenious mechanical pumps that could be driven that would bring the water from the river up to the top, and it, there were fountains that were flowing down. And it was described as one of the most beautiful places you walked, and then you could spiral down through the gardens uh, on this man-made mountain. And so this is just a small thing. Gold was everywhere. They said the walls were so high that you could ride five chariots abreast on top of the walls. And you could turn a chariot around. I mean, it, and there were towers everywhere. And many believe Herodotus, the historian, exaggerated. Uh, but he said it was 60 miles around the city. Well, you know, it says that Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey in the book of Jonah. So there may have been things a little bigger than we can even imagine right now. And he's got gold everywhere. It's all glinted with gold. Remember, he had that big statue of gold. And so he wakes up one morning and he's walking around the palace and he sees everything gilded and sparkly and it's wonder and it's inspiring. His musicians are playing. He takes a deep breath. He goes, ha, 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 I built all this. Is not this the great Babylon that I have made? Let, let me give it to you in his own words. It, it tells us here, uh, said verse, yeah, thank you, verse 30, the king spoke and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power, for the honor of my majesty? Who does that sound like? I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. It's like the devil. 
He is full of himself. He's full of pride. What goes before a fall? Pride. And no sooner had he said that the word was still in the king's mouth. A voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you that fast. And they'll drive you from men, and your dwelling will be with the beasts of the field. And you will eat grass like the oxen, and seven times will pass over you until you know, you're going to be punished seven times, until you know the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he chooses. That very word, that very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and ate grass like the oxen, and he went mad. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair was grown like eagle feathers and his nails like bird claws. And there's been a few documents that were written, and uh, some of them are dubious, but uh, one says that uh, one of his servants uh, basically was able to take charge and hide what had happened to the king, and he ruled Babylon for seven years. He didn't want anyone to know the king. He lost his mind. They pretty much hid it from the people, and that's why his kingdom was preserved. He said, the Lord puts over it the basis to people, and when they finally discovered that a servant was saying, yeah, the king says this, the king says that, and sealing documents, or there was a little conspiracy of servants that hid the king's deranged condition for years, and when it says his hair became like eagle feathers, it doesn't mean that and that was a figure of speech when someone's out of their mind and they don't trim themselves, their hair gets matted and it starts to look like eagle feathers. Actually, the... The uh, uh, Aramaic version of the Bible in this story, it says his hair became a, like a lion's mane. It's actually a different phrase. And his fingernails became long and untrimmed. That's all it means. It's little claws like eagles. He became like an animal, a beast. And people get hungry enough. He may not have been eating just alfalfa hay, but they start eating weeds and plants in the field. And it's amazing that he survived. Now, I don't know if you've read the story. 17... 38 to 1820 was King George III. Have you heard about King George III? That's during the time of the American Revolution. He was a pretty brilliant guy, and uh, he was king, but later in his life, they're not sure exactly what it was. So it could have been some disease. It could have been some kind of bipolar disorder, but he went crazy, just stark raving mad. And this court was trying to hide it from the people because they were going to lose their positions and their power. And part of the reason <laughs> I think this all happened was it was in the midst of all this madness and bad orders that he gave, America was able to obtain its freedom. The king went crazy. How, how many of you have heard this in history? King George III, yeah. He would start talking, and he would give 400 words in one sentence, and he'd keep talking and talking until he, he wouldn't take a breath. He was foaming at the mouth. And uh, he'd go around naked. Uh, and it just, they don't, everyone's tried to theorize it was a medical thing. They said that his urine was blue or purple, and they said, oh, that's typical of this, and that can make you crazy, and that all these uh, ideas of what happened. But he would have these bouts of insanity that would last for months, and then all of a sudden he'd wake up and his, he'd start seeming coherent and lucid again, and then he died pretty much uh, crazy. Uh, that's not a nice way to put it, but... Yeah, and it, but some of it was dementia at that point. But anyway, it, they hid it from the people so that he could stay on the throne. And it's not the first time this has happened. It happened with Nebuchadnezzar, of course. Now, what was the main reason for his fall? I, I. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before fall. What was it that brought down King Herod? You know, the Herod in, Dan, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 12? The people said it's the voice of a God and not a man. And he did not give God the glory. The angel of the Lord struck him that very moment and he died and was eaten of worms. Be careful about pride. Someone said, never are you more like the devil than when you're proud. And uh, I remember hearing uh, John Knox, a great reformed preacher. He was preaching in this church one day and after church, folks were greeting him at the door and this lady met him at the door and she said, Pastor Knox, you are the greatest preacher in all of Scotland. He said, I know, madam, the devil tells me that all the time. <laughs> and so uh, what was it that brought down King Uzziah? 
King Isaiah walked, walked into the temple of the Lord. He said, all these other kings, they can go into their temples. How come I can't go into the holy place? Not even the most holy place. King wasn't supposed to go into the holy place. And he got a censer and he started walking and the priest stopped him and said, it's not for you, as I, it's only for the sons of Aaron. He got mad and he just, the pride was offended. Leprosy broke out in his forehead. Pride. What brought down King Saul? He was more worried about what the people thought of him than what God thought of him. Pride. Pride is really a form of selfishness, isn't it? It's just like selfishness to the extreme. It's like these folks in Hollywood. Their lives are all built around making them idols. And they sit around at their cocktail parties and they talk to each other and one person says, oh, I'm so sorry, I've been talking about nothing but me. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? <laughs> and pride is an arrow that always points to self. Listen to this, Christ Object Lessons, page 154. The evil that led to Peter's fall and shut out the Pharisee from communion with God is proving the ruin of thousands today. There is nothing so offensive to God, so dangerous to the human soul as pride and self-sufficiency. Of all sins, it is the most hopeless and the most incurable. Well, the good news is that after seven times of Nebuchadnezzar living like this, uh, when the time was up, his reason was restored. He suddenly realized that the dream had come true. He looks at himself. He's on all four. His fingernails are grown. His hair is dirty. He stinks. But his mind has come back. And he says, I guess I wasn't so great. You know, the last thing he remembered, isn't this the great Babylon I've created? He finally wakes up and he says, now look at me. And he came to his senses. Martin Luther said, God creates from nothing. And until we become nothing, he can do nothing with us. It's when we humble ourselves, he will lift us up. As long as we are selfish and proud, it is so hard for God to work with us. What was this? the first thing Jesus said to the religious leaders? You pray to be seen. You fast to be seen of men. You give to be seen of men. You're only worried about what people think of you. And you don't care what God thinks of you. It is the most hopeless thing. Until we come to the place where we can humble ourselves, uh, there's not much God can do with us. Finally, he lifts his eyes to heaven. You know the definition of love, 1 Corinthians 13? Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Jesus, God, is love. He is humble. Christ said, he that is greatest among you will be your servant. He who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. <clears throat> if you look in um, 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name will do what? Humble themselves and pray. Then what will God do? It starts, if you want to have a revival in your life or in the church or among your people, we've got to humble ourselves. It wasn't until the disciples put aside their differences and humbled themselves. Micah 6, 8, he's shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to walk, love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. You know, I, this to me is such a powerful truth. Even King Ahab, after he killed Naboth and did all these terrible things and persecuted the prophets, he tore his clothes after Elijah pronounced a judgment on him. He wore sackcloth. And listen to what God says to Elijah, 1 Kings 21, verse 29. See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring calamity in his days. When Rehoboam humbled himself, God lengthened his tranquility. The Bible says the humble he guides in justice. You can read 2 Chronicles 12, verse 6. So the leaders of Israel, the kings, they humbled themselves. They said the Lord is righteous. When the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah saying, they've humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will give them some deliverance. If you want a lengthening of your tranquility, it's a very consistent Bible teaching. Humble yourself. You know what stops evangelism? Pride. Ellen White says, if we would humble ourselves before the Lord, if we would humble ourselves before the Lord, be kind and courteous and tender-hearted and pitiful, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one. So let us humble ourselves before the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar's last words, 
The heart of a beast is taken away and he's given back the heart of a man. And he says, my reason returned to me in verse 36. And the glory of my kingdom, my honor, my splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles came to me. He's counseling others. I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. But now, I don't take the credit, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. He doesn't say, is this my great Babylon? All of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he's able to put down. And he's saying, I'm exhibit A. God has given me a position of glory, but I don't glory in it. And nothing's more majestic than a great king who is humble. Now, who is the greatest king that was the most humble? I'll close with this verse. Philippians 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He's in God's form. He's in equality with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Because he did this, therefore God has also highly exalted him. He who humbles himself will be exalted. God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth those in the branches and those under the tree, <laughs> that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Can you say amen? And is Christ now proud of his uh, glory in heaven? Or is he still humble? He's humble still. It is a great study. It is a great story. Amen? amen. All right, we're out of time. But I want to remind our friends that are watching before we go off the air, we have a free offer called The Armor of God. We'll send it to you for free. You can just call. Ask for it, 866-788-3966. Or if you want it now, you can download it by texting. Just fill in the information, text SH101 and text that to 40544. Ask for offer 173 when you write. And that's a gift uh, from us to you. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this uh, magnificent story in the Bible that uh, just tells us about the battle between pride and humility, what the consequences are, and ultimately, only you deserve the glory and the honor as the high God. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, we can learn the lesson of Nebuchadnezzar without having to go through that experience. And I pray that you'll bless us with the mind of Christ. Um, be with us in our service that follows. Please bless the offering we're about to receive, and we thank you for all of your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.